Hello and welcome to another episode of D-Web Decoded. I am your special guest host for this week's chat with Claudia Richaud from Banyan. My name is Porter Stoll and I'm a head of storage provider community within the Filecoin Foundation. Claudia, how are we doing today? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. This is my first time being on a podcast, so I'm hyped. Yeah. This is my first D-Web Decoded as well, so I'm super excited to be here. First question, Let's. Uh, there's so much I want to cover with you today. I um, always look forward to our chats. Where in the world are you today? I am in my apartment in Gramercy in Manhattan, which is also where the company is based, right down the road, but I'm at home today. How long have you been a New York resident? Uh, two months, according to my driver's license, but I've been popping in and out of the city since 2019, like between there and Chicago, where I went to college. Very nice. Uh, and I, I, I want to get more into your background. I am coming to you live from Park City, Utah, where uh, I live and it's always good. excited to talk with people from the Filecoin community from across the globe. You never know where people may be on any given day. So Claudia. Uh, I, for those who don't know you, you are one fascinating person within Filecoin. Uh, tell us about yourself uh, and how did we get to this point where we're talking today? I got into computers as a teenager, met a bunch of random people on the internet in like IRC and image boards and all sorts of stuff and just got into programming and my friends got me into cryptography when I was like 15. And then um, we did a lot of CTFs. Those were fun. I uh, saw the Bitcoin and Ethereum white papers then, was very excited by the tech, but, you know, didn't really know how to get involved for a while. Who gets into cryptography at 15? <laughs> oh, just my friends were really into cybersecurity and they, um, I couldn't do any of the binary reversing because I didn't understand how the computer worked. So instead I was like, oh, okay, this cryptography looks like high school math, which it is just with a bunch of fancy notation. Um, and so I was able to crack some of the, some of the problems and I was even able to crack some of the harder, like high school CTF level CTF problems, because, you know, if you just pretend that it's high school algebra, cause it kind of looks like it, you learn the special rules for like operating in a group or elliptic curves and stuff. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, you can crack the problem. So that was pretty fun. Um, I was just really excited about code breaking cause it seemed like spies and stuff. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I got into that. I really thought I was going to be a physicist for a while. So my... When I was like 18, I like interned at a particle accelerator lab when I was at UMD, um, realized that physics didn't really make money. And also the kind of physics that I wanted to do is very, very competitive. So I started focusing more on CS and math stuff. Um, I got a lot of different cybersecurity internships over a couple different years. Like I went, I ended up at a government contractor. Um, I briefly worked as an intern at Wolfram in the signal processing department. Actually, not briefly. It was like a year on and off. Um, Dropbox, Jane Street. Um, yeah, Claudia, I was like, yeah, in classes. I just like worked everywhere in college because I realized like if you work somewhere, you get an opportunity to learn a lot. So that was cool. Um, so that was college. Um, I really didn't get into blockchain until I got a cryptography job at Trail of Bits, um, where I got to audit software. And all of a sudden, I started seeing like, oh, you know, you see the blockchain stuff in the news and it all looks like scams, but I was seeing some of the most interesting cryptography that I'd seen, including in like, you know, graduate crypto textbooks where it's like, oh, here's a really crazy MPC protocol. Um, this is a really challenging thing that we've built. Uh, it's just like a problem though. Like this is total moon math. You see that in real life in crypto. So that was really cool. I, I remember just being very excited by some of the MPC protocols that I was seeing as an auditor at Trail of Bits. Um, then I got to do a little bit of like ZK research, which was even brought in like compilers and programming languages stuff. So by then, like the bug had just bit me. Um, but, you know, I was like, OK, I need to go finish my master's. So I went back to Chicago. I did about five more months of master's program, which was like a machine learning master's program. Um, yeah, it was I was like focusing on like deep learning and like theory kind of mathy stuff. Um, and then DeFi summer started happening and I just started getting people on my LinkedIn all the time asking me to do pretty crazy, interesting things. And I was like, oh, okay, I need the money. Like, all right. So I put my master's on hold. I still have not gone back. I did graduate undergrad halfway through working at Trail of or at Protocol Labs though. Um, so 
What yeah, was the, in the in the DeFi summer <laughs> that you got all these crazy requests? What what is the most notable or crazy request that you got? I'm not gonna go into the crazy stuff because I feel it was definitely like a bumpy ride. But the coolest thing I got to work on that was really exciting is I got to contribute to the Haskell implementation of the EVM with the DAP Tools guys who came out of MakerDAO. Um, I helped implement helped I did not do it alone. Uh, implement the Berlin hard fork of Ethereum on the HEVM. And that was really cool because, you know, HEVM is used for a lot of symbolic execution and cybersecurity stuff. And also it's in Haskell. I just, you know, I love programming languages like that. Um, So I had a lot of fun with that one. Got to talk to a lot of really, really smart people. Um, I learned some tokenomics stuff. I started studying like game theory and microeconomics and mechanism design for the first time that summer as well. Um, That was a little bit less... That was a le- little bit less of my work because I was definitely not an econ expert. I'm still not an econ expert. But yeah, I don't know. Like I really got – everyone was so thirsty for like developer talent at that point right. that it was just very easy to like pick up a one-off job, pick up another one-off job, um, and really get like a full view of everything going on, which, you know, it was cool. It served me well as well. So we've been talking for a couple minutes now, and there's <laughs> one word that keeps surfacing that I'm super fascinated by. And you keep saying things are cool. Uh, And I I just want to know what is cool to Claudia? Because like that is in itself a very interesting discussion. What's cool Um, for you? I think the way I, there's a lot of things that are cool, uh, but I can use the sense of the term that I've been using it in this discussion, which is, I guess, like intellectually cool or like engineering wise cool. Um, I like things like, I read a lot of philosophy and science stuff in my free time. Lately, I've been on a big like anthropology kick and then also like a consciousness science kick um, simultaneously. Yeah, I made a friend at Zuzulu who is really in like he does a lot of consciousness science theorizing. We've just been like in, in each other's DMs constantly like sending each other papers, which is, you know, I always that's like my favorite kind of friendship. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think elegant ideas that explain tendencies about the world that you know you notice over and over and over again um and you're just like oh that is a really that makes sense that contextualizes so many different observations that i've had over such a long time so definitely the consciousness science stuff is really cool because uh you know things that you may experience like if you've ever been into like meditation or anything like the things you experience during that or um yeah, just like observing your own thoughts and psychology. Uh, a lot of that starts making a lot more sense once you see like this consciousness neuroscience stuff. It's like, oh, okay, that's why I feel this kind of concentration when I drink a green tea versus when I drink a coffee. Yay, green tea. Keep, keeping with the concept of cool, uh, I'd love to know about Banyan. Uh, and I yeah. think our audience would love to know about Banyan because we can only assume this represents an amalgamation of all the things that you think are cool. Kind of. Um, it's less cool than it is important, in my opinion. Um, the internet has always been a source of, yeah, just knowledge and friendship and all sorts of stuff for me. Cause I, I like moved every two years as a kid, my friends were on there. So I've always just been very passionate about like the internet and making sure it's a good place and making sure it's not censored and everything. So that's why I started at Filecoin. Um, I was an engineer at Filecoin on the core runtime and you know pretty quickly i was like oh i see an opportunity like by nucleating a company outside of filecoin you know adjacent to protocol labs obviously um where i can really accelerate the ways that they're already bettering the internet um and you know i approached it the wrong way the first time around and then we pivoted uh, but now what Banyan is doing is we're trying to make Filecoin accessible to the everyday user and like the people who actually have a lot of data. So for us, that's like small and medium businesses who are currently being underserved. I mean, so our first target market in the go to market is like people who are being kind of underserved by existing Web2 uh, data storage services. Um, but we really like we want to make decentralized storage content address storage is personally, I think that's even like more exciting than decentralized storage. Um, We want to make that accessible to the broader market, get people using end-to-end encryption, get people having a little bit of sovereignty over their data 
Um, so that's really how Banyan is. It's like we built an accessible product that normal people, normal businesses can use. They don't have to be technical. It's the expected user experience. It's the expected level of like SLAs, um, expected level of just guarantees in general about the storage. So you don't have to like sacrifice to be on Web3, which, you know, a lot of Web3 is just a very like crappy user experience. Like normal people are like, what? I don't have time to get into this. Um, so we're, we're coming to them, not making them come to us and making decentralized content address, local first, encrypted end-to-end -end storage usable to the people who actually have big data needs and are like maybe willing to try something new, try something that's not the Web2 incumbent. So that's where we're at right now. Um, I think that's very cool because I think it makes the internet and people's, people's time using the computer less bad because, you know, your experience on the computer can be quite bad. Uh, in a lot of different horrifying ways. And I think if we make it not bad, that's definitely making the world better. From your experience out there in the marketplace so far, when give me an example of when you saw your customer or user base have an aha moment where, you know, okay, all this makes sense. Kind of put me yeah. in that moment. What happened and what was the reaction or the, the discovery from the user? What's been really interesting is people just when it comes to people who have like large amounts of data that they need to access use transit safeguard in different ways a lot of people are just kind of out there suffering <laughs> like they like their experience is just kind of bad in about 8 million ways or it's like risky like you know they know that ransomware is scary their buddy got ransomware a couple months ago but they've still got a setup that leaves them really open to ransomware. And they kind of don't know what to do because most of the big cloud backup companies are targeting, you know, very large enterprises that have an IT department. So they're not very friendly to the everyday user. So what was really surprising to me is just people are just kind of suffering. They're suffering in silence. They don't know that there are tools that can make their life around their data easier. I'm talking about people who have like 60 terabytes of data. So these are, for context, these are like digital creatives. These are, um, these are like videography studios. These are architects that we're mostly talking about. Or, you know, academics, they've got the one like Omelas kid PhD student that is in charge of the data server, which is riddled with malware. And this person is just like, yeah, it's a migraine and I just deal with it because my PI told me to. So how, like they'll have very basic realizations where they like, they know the cloud is out there. They don't realize it can make their life easier because it hasn't been targeted to them. So it's been like very, it hasn't been like, oh my God, I need end to end encryption. It's been, oh, my backups could be easy my life sharing files could be easy. Like I don't need to be stressed about my people have sent us pictures of an entire shelf full of 50 hard drives <laughs> that their life's work is on and tell us, yeah, I live in California. Wildfires are coming, but I'm overwhelmed by the process of uploading this. And we're just like, Oh, like these people are just like, it's actually, it makes me sad because like web two tech has not, there, there are people who have just been left behind entirely by that or like don't know that they can't they don't know that like cloud backups protect against ransomware so like the aha moment the aha moments that i've seen have just really surprised me frankly because people people are are often in the 90s because tech has failed them so yeah that's that's been crazy i, I really love uh i think that you you mentioned a, a persona type in filecoin that has been one of our early adopters that i really love the story of it, and you said it really nicely. It's their life's work. Yeah. And just think of like the emotional attachment, not even like the value of the data. I mean, it's got to be so heartbreaking if you were to lose that or it's just something that would happen. Like, yes, you, you are going to seek out opportunities for more resiliency, more availability, uh, longer term solutions there. And, and I do like, I put myself in the shoes of a researcher or someone writing a thesis. And I, I can empathize with that person. Like you want like your whole goal of pursuing this track in your life and career was for this data to persist and for it to be meaningful. Like, yeah. And I know you've had some intimate experiences with these types of personas. I'd love to just hear your perspective on it as well. Yeah. One thing that we hear over and over again is um, like legacy, legacy, legacy. I'm like very familiar with like 
bit rot. Um, I wouldn't say I'm involved, but I'm definitely like a fan watching from a distance of like the internet archive and a lot of affiliated projects. And I'm, you know, for a while, probably less now because I have less free time, very intense user of the internet archive and just seeing the bit rot or seeing people who like kind of maliciously use DMCA to take down content about them that they didn't want on the internet that probably should have stayed on the internet um, or like been archived somewhere. Um, stuff like that. Just seeing that bit rot made me really, really angry. So I, I was completely unsurprised when my team did calls with photojournalists and videographers and we heard over and over again, like, oh, yeah, this crazy Pulitzer Prize winning videographer passed away. Um, their archives now belong to not going to name names, some big media organization. And yeah, it's just bit rotting. Like they, they aren't taking care of it. They aren't publishing it anywhere. They haven't like paid the server hosting costs to make it accessible. And what's worse, like it's just kind of in shambles, like maybe some of its physical film, which is not great. That stuff decays. Um, and like the digital component of it is just, it's not being published. Like nobody can use it. Like they don't really, like people will go and make requests and say, can I get the original of this photo? And they like, will take a really long time to service it. So there's a lot of concerns about just curation and loss there. And that's not a problem that's entirely solved by better data storage content addressing, you know, decentralized protocols. But I think that like, we can probably help with some of the technical components. There's also like a, you know, you need museum people to curate and publish and educate and contextualize. But yeah, that's been really interesting because I'm like, oh, I know how to fix that technically. Like that's not hard. And it's really sad that nobody's done it. So, yeah. You got me. Uh, it's not <laughs> often someone can stump me on a use case in Filecoin, but frankly, I, I stand corrected. I, no one has discussed with me so far estate planning for, for yeah. Like, for file yeah, we hear that so much from these people. It's so crazy. Um, I think I think like three or four of our user interviews have brought that up to people on my team. Um, which, yeah, I think I think what could be a good solution to this that I, I've brought it up with a couple people. Like I think I talked to Jesse Damiani and uh, Jonathan Victor and Addy Wagonact all about this saying more or less like you know we can build the storage like we can make it accessible we can make it nice i know project starling and the showa foundation are doing some really interesting stuff about long-term archival of stuff that's you know similarly important which is like documenting war crimes which really yeah like you you don't want that to get messed up like that's important for an accurate record of history but like for the estate planning and like you know the museum stuff i was like what if there was like a DAO or something that basically operated as a museum you know you have you have some kind of fund for the data you have people on staff who are able to curate it maybe you invest some of this fund um so that it can you know get donations like you know operate it financially like a museum and then you can administer like what you are administering is not a museum property with like physical objects and artifacts inside that need to be air conditioned and, you know, spruced up every five years. But instead, it's just like, you need to pay the server bill. You need to pay the server bill, you need to pay the hosting bill. Um, that's pretty accessible through Filecoin. So this this whole concept was actually what I initially, like what initially Banyan was supposed to be. I didn't really understand that that would be difficult to raise VC money for. And I also didn't realize that a lot of the architecture to technically make it a reality like didn't exist so that's why we pivoted i was like let's pivot into something where we can build the architecture that's going to make it a reality figure out how to like you know capitalism wise make it sustainable like we need something people will pay for um and then we can think about the storage stuff so yeah like that's anyway that's that's a deep banyan lore but yeah i think it would be really cool if someone built this down and like we were actually able to like maintain people's life work for a long time and figure out the correct financial structure to make that happen. You mentioned a term earlier that I think relates to the, the conversation we were just having, uh, which is data sovereignty. Yeah. I feel like that data, data sovereignty is under discussed across the ecosystem. Yeah. How do you view data sovereignty and what should the, what conversation would you recommend that more people have around it? I, so to me, there's a lot of different terms that people have used for this. I think data sovereignty is the best one. I think it 
communicates the best vibe, but people talk about decentralization as a no one person can control the fate of the protocol. Well, that's not exactly right, because I don't really care about the protocol so much for this. I care about my pictures of my dog <laughs> and my text messages, um, like for for like what I'm trying to get at for this. And another one is like local first software, the local first software movement. They're actually having a little unconference after Strange Loop this week that I'm attending. I'm so excited. Um, but the local first software is like, oh, the com- the computation happens directly peer to peer. I own my data. You own your data. We could have a Google Docs where there's no trusted interme- intermediary server. We just use this like you know cool concept called CRDTs where we exchange the changes between each other. It's totally peer to peer and we both have copies locally. So there's that. Um, There's trustlessness where you don't trust anyone else to, uh, you know, take care of your data, see your data, whatever. Like all of these terms are kind of nebulous and unclearly defined, which is fine because you're bundling together so many different technologies. But I think marketing data sovereignty, like to the extent that's necessary, you have control over your data. Um, no one can train an AI on your data. No one can, you know, that may that may mean end-to-end encryption. That may mean um, multiple servers have a copy of your data and none of them are the person who's gating access. So it's not like Facebook can ban you and you lose, you know, all the messages with your spouse for the first 10 years of your relationship. Like nothing like, like that's all part of data sovereignty. So I think the proper term will cover a variety of situations, a variety of technologies. But I think it really, it's quite important, especially in the era of LLMs to help the consumer to understand your data is not yours right now. You can get Cambridge Analytica very, very easily. Um, It's so much easier for someone to get very scary insights about you now that we have these LLMs. Like this is data mining that is made easy for anyone to do. Like, you can just type a query and say, what's the most embarrassing thing Claudia has ever done? Search her DMs. And like, it'll give you a list of 10 things like these. It's like you have an army of analysts, anyone who has your data does. So I think it's very important for the customer to kind of get this whole idea of you need to be able to own your data. You need to be able to get your data back. You need to be able to make sure nobody's changed it. You need to make sure that nobody's doing anything to it. And you need to make sure that nobody's using it. Um, And I don't really know like a strict definition of all five of these things, but they're definitely getting more education to the public about this is really, really, really vital. Cause right now they're just kind of vaguely scared. They're like, Oh, the tech companies are bad. Um, people don't understand what encryption does and does not do for them, which I don't think people need to delve into the specifics. Like not everyone needs to be highly educated on tech, but I think having the idea of like, I want my, I want to own my data. I want to have control over it. And then letting letting the tech industry handle the actual implementation of that and, you know, coming up with standards to make sure that we're doing that honestly is really important in the next couple of years. Sorry, that was kind of a wandering discussion. No, that. no, but I think you're you segue into something that I find really interesting. Another thing I think is under discussed, but I think touches on a lot of the points you just made. I think so much in Filecoin right now is about you know enterprise adoption, you know, working with the you know, the research institutions getting those, these large data sets, public data sets onto the network and, you know, storing humanity's data. But where I see this going is eventually we're going to get to individual data. And, you know, you said yourself, you're working like with clients that have about 60 tips. How long is it till one, an individual such as myself or you with a, a million and one dog pictures gets to the level of 60 tips? And then, like, you know, playing off this, like, this data sovereignty and, the, you know, the rise of LMMs, like, is there a future where I need to look to store my own personal data on Filecoin because it gives me, you know, control over how it's used? Because no one's really thinking about that yet. Uh, but I do think it's, you know, it's an interesting future potential. Okay. So I, uh, like, three different points came through my head. So, hold me to discussing all three of these. If you want to actually hear it, I will forget. Um, Thing one is your data is growing because hard drives are growing and becoming cheaper. Um, The amount of compute and RAM that all the programs on your computer take has just been growing a ton as the hardware. Like it basically, you know, the task 
grows to fill the time that you give it in real life while the program and the data fill to expand to the hardware that you give it. Like the dev is not going to spend all his time optimizing instead of building features if we know that your computer's got 16 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte hard drive. Also, you get so much more quality with video and photo content. So that that gets really, really big. Um, your personal data life, like all of the data that you produce is just, it's like ballooning um, because the capabilities of the, you know, data production devices and programs and everything, that's just all growing. Um, and you're interacting so much more with the internet. And every time you interact with the internet, you probably produce some data. And some of that may be stuff that, sirens, New York. Um, the, some of that stuff is going to be stuff that you want to keep around with you. So yes, the amount of data that you produce is going to grow. Um, you're going to become a 60 tib person pretty soon. Like one day you will like my iCloud, I just keep having to bump it, bump it, bump it. Cause I store more memes and more pictures of my dog. So, you know, your data footprint is going to grow. Um, eventually you're going to get to a place where, you know, the underlying cost to store all your data, if it's not being offset by the company that's storing your data, somehow monetizing it or them selling you on another service, like that's going to become a cost because the hard drive price is going to, you know, it's going to stay at some level, even with like cloud hyperscalers. So that's the thing. Um, so that's kind of interesting and scary. Like you, you definitely... My iCloud bill just keeps going up year after year. I don't go back and delete my archives. Uh, there's going to need to be a solution to that at some point, like especially people from my generation. Like by the time I'm 50 and like, oh my God, grandkids. Like again, let's get back to that estate planning. Like I don't know if you've ever had to clean out an estate, but like the belongings are pretty bad. Imagine if there's also 20 terabytes of data that could be like precious. Like, oh my gosh. So um, you've got that. And then... I think the question of Filecoin adoption is going to be, do we continue on this like pathological path of every single app you use just has a little silo of data? Like it's not just you have to enter your address into every freaking web app you use. It's also like Facebook's got my family photos. Instagram's got my pictures with my friends. Facebook's got my DMs with all of my friendships since time immemorial. Um, I, I'm just segmented across like a jillion different apps. So unifying that, and letting the consumer own it, I think, I don't really know how that's going to happen uh, because there's 20 different apps with 20 different APIs and whoever has to integrate that, like that's going to be a nightmare. And then also getting it so that the apps can operate on one centralized repository of just my data instead of um, they're all, all their own local hard drives. So that's a hard Web3 problem, like figuring out how to go to market and get all that data migrated and get all the apps to use my data rather than a bunch of different data and like let me have all my data in one place so that's that's a hard problem i'm not going to get into that i think disco is looking at how to solve that but i don't know um seeing individuals on filecoin i think the most important thing is product and this is something that i've returned to time and time again with banyan um we're targeting smbs so we're doing one step down from the enterprise they don't have an it team they don't necessarily have or need to have or want to have technical skills because they are experts in another domain. Why should they have to learn the guts of the computer? So Backblaze and Dropbox already make it pretty easy for a lot of these people um, on personal scale. Um, but there's a lot, like you just need to solve problems for the user. I think, yeah, like easy uploads are really important. So the current Filecoin experience where if you want to upload multiple terabytes, you have to run the singularity script. You have to figure out how to ship it to a miner. You have to think about like data center peering if you're shipping petabytes or you have to ship hard drives. Like that's a nightmare. The user doesn't want to do that and they will default to centralized solutions if you make them do that. So we're trying to make it a step down easier and solve a lot of these problems for the user. Now for individuals, I think one of the biggest barriers, like our product would work for an individual. However, individuals want integration, like, you know, when you type a Google Drive link into Google Docs, it just links to the file, easily clickable, the permissions are integrated with my Google Workspace. So integrations are incredibly important and will be a large barrier to access. The other thing is key management, because if you lose your keys, and that's just the end, like you've lost all of your data, that's a big problem. But I see the account abstraction tech coming out of Ethereum, where it's like, oh, you have the scan your face with Apple to get a cryptographic key. Um, and various other ways to derive cryptographic keys from easier to use technologies like a YubiKey or things that are harder to lose. 
all of that's going to be really positive for that. So I feel like the individual sides developing my, my scary thing more is like that centerpiece I talked about where, yeah, you've got 8 million apps that all want to sit on your data because it's their startups moat. So how are you going to get it out? How are you going to like make your data sovereign and use Filecoin? But yeah, I don't know. I think, I think there's hope. I think there's a lot of people working on this. Um, who are very smart and working very hard. So we'll see where the future goes. So you gave me uh, a little bit of a glimpse into the, some of the things that you're working on, uh, usability issues that you're trying to tackle in terms of what Banyan's focused on. What else can we expect from Va- Banyan over the next six months, 18 months uh, on your horizon? Yeah, so we are currently launching, like that is present, Tense. Is that a Garen? No, it's not. Maybe it is. I don't know. Anyway, parts of speech. Um, we're launching. It's a multi-month process because we're slowly opening it up to multi- to more people. We're also coming out of stealth because we just, I didn't see a point in talking. Like we raised 3.8 million, but I, I didn't really want to talk about us too publicly until we had something that I wanted people's eyeballs on. And now we finally have something that I want people's eyeballs on. So we're launching. We're starting to talk to PR firms. Um, We're producing so much content internally. I'm giving a bunch of talks in the next couple months, this podcast, blog posts. Um, Phil Vegas. You're going to be in Phil Vegas. Vegas. Oh my gosh. Talking about AI and Filecoin. That's going to be fun. Um, But Tim has been giving talks to a lot of SPs. We've been recruiting SPs to provide storage because we we have them under contract because that's what our customer segment expects. They're not going to use it without that. So, you know, going to market with the SPs, we're really going to scale with the SPs. They're reselling our product to their existing customers because they're data centers and MSPs. So they have their own data storage clients. So scaling that program, scaling our direct sales, scaling a lot of our partnerships. We're talking to some really cool people right now in like, DSI space, uh, D climate. Well, I guess that's the name of the startup, but like decentralized climate uh, stuff. Um, who else? Yeah, uh, we're talking to like some cultural institutions or like preliminary conversations with them um, just to like get some partnerships, get that going. Um, we've been talking to some people around the Filecoin space, like lending protocols and ceiling as a service. These are also, again, very like preliminary conversations, but just getting more benefits for the SPs that work with us so that they're more excited to work with us. So we're really going to scale into the Filecoin ecosystem and around Web3, scale our direct sales, launch. Um, After we get to GA in November and we've implemented all of the features that were our target for GA, We've got a couple different directions that we're thinking about going in. So we really want to, we want to make people's lives around their data easier. That's like the motivating factor of our product. And that's why we think we can pull them off of web two incumbents. Cause a lot of them are using a tape together solution from Dropbox. We transfer backblaze, our sync. These people are suffering. They have to move between apps all the time. It's a horrible experience. So we're thinking we kind of want to vertically integrate and the stack of, I guess, verticality that you can integrate over is uh, it's like hotness of data. So going from, you know, we've got the deep archival product that goes to Filecoin. We've got a hotter archival product that's also content addressed. It may have an extra replication that's backed up to Filecoin, but this is basically the unsealed copy and we pay the SP separately for that. Thinking about CDN speed retrievals is something that we're thinking about next. Um, Adding better product features, like we were talking about figuring out how to do a privacy respecting vector database search over the data um, so you can use AI to like query all of your data and make that work with video data and textual data. So we're thinking about that. Um, It's more of a feature than a product. We're really going to focus on things that help us sell and drive revenue. Um, We've been thinking about government contracting. Not sure if that's a good idea, but yeah, expanding to more verticals, take like really in that tight uh, feedback loop of like customer feedback, iterate, build, build, build. Um, we don't want to lock ourselves into any one vertical, but we also do want to, when we go for a vertical, we want to win there. Um, so definitely like building features specifically for the videographers. Um, we're talking to con- some construction and oil and gas industry people that have like large amounts of data. So zeroing in there. And all of this is in preparation for our Series A, which will probably be spring or summer of next year. Um, that's That's definitely on our roadmap. We're just... Yeah, we're we're trying to 
we're trying to decide for our series a do we want to you know raise on we're going to do another big moonshot like perhaps launch a cdn kind of thing or do we want to go more with the narrative of we've got traction and we want to double down and scale that i think either one's an option um it's i think we got to see what is the risk tolerance of the market what are our customers saying what is our revenue looking like um but yeah that's all coming up soon i'm really i'm excited the team is really working super hard right now um we're just grinding and growing and you know getting our product in the hands of real people and solving real problems with it 100% you you mentioned working closely with a storage provider community across filecoin uh as a champion of your message, what would you say is the, the clear what's in it for them from working with Banyan? US dollars, like we'll pay you. We'll pay you per terabyte to um, like host our data. So that's with hot storage, you don't have to steal it, seal it. Or if you're hosting a replica for hot storage, which then becomes cold storage, you do have to seal it. Um, we pay, I need to check what I'm allowed to say with my BD because he handles all of those negotiations, but we pay like a flat dollar rate per terabyte per month. Um, we're exploring, this is alpha. Uh, we've, we've had preliminary discussions with Glyph about how we can get better loan terms for our SPs through Glyph. Um, that's preliminary. That's not locked in yet. If you're working with us, pretend you didn't hear that. Um, but yeah, so we're talking to them. We basically handle their BD pipeline and their like product side of things for them. So if they've got a customer where it's like, hey, we want the block rewards of sealing onto Filecoin. Hey, here's the benefits of decentralization. But they're like, that's so hard to access my data. There's no like pretty layer over Filecoin where I can just click, click, click and like share with my employees and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, we will take a little bit of margin over what you would probably already be charging them. You might even be charging them the same. If it's a customer that came in from you as an SP, we will give you a reseller chunk of our margin. Um, like we have we have this reseller agreement that I think is in like the final draft stages, um, but we'll give you a chunk of our margin that we would be taking and then, you know, charge them the amount that we say. You will get one of the copies. So you will get one of the block rewards. Um, and then we'll distribute some other copies to however, how, whatever replication tolerance the user has. So we like, we take over your BD pipeline. We take over a lot of the SLAs. Um, we take over like providing a nice product and interface to this person. Like you don't have to go run like, what is it? Minim, not Minim, um, Minio, Minio over top of like a hot copy. Like you don't have to do that. We've got it handled. Like just let us handle it. So it's really I, good. I for love that. And especially. I think it, it you know, the biggest trend I see across Filecoin over the last year is that more and more people are just specializing in their core levels of expertise. With a storage provider, for many of them, the optimal strategy is to, you know, abstract away all the sales BD work and just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a wholesale rate and I'm just going to store. And then you have a whole nother, you know, people like yourselves coming up in the ecosystem, like, hey, we're driving paid storage opportunities onto the network and we're just going to make, we're, we're just going to man, manage the whole front end, top, you know, front end of the funnel and the user experience to make this a reality. And I, I, the more specialization, the more it's creating a, a stronger flywheel effect in my opinion. So it's super yeah, exciting like to the see. The storage providers, there's a few that are like, you know, they, they want to run a BD organization on the side. And a lot of these people already have large businesses and Filecoin sure. is just aspect of their business they're already running a big data center and it makes sense for them to be running bd but for a smaller sp which is what you really need to secure the network like you need diversity these people you know they have a career doing you know data center -y things or maybe even running miners for other protocols but they don't have this whole business infrastructure and it you know the the health of the protocol depends on it not taking you being like a multi-million dollar in revenue every year organization to run a node and store some data. Like you need a baseline level of able to make sure that, you know, the disks run, like you're not getting faulted all the time, but having a BD org, having HR, like that just jacks up the price of storage. Like having, you know, 800 of those for each of 800 miners is just a huge waste that like drives up the price of storage when that's like not the services that they need to provide. So letting us handle 
a lot of this op stuff, a lot of the consumer education that needs to happen in order to sell this, the product building, uh, the outreach, the like customer service. Yeah, like centralizing that to one point really, I, I think it helps miners to thrive. October 4th, you are going to be joining us uh, at Phil Vegas. Phil Vegas is going to be the first Filecoin event in North America since I want to say April 2022. We have some of the most tenured experts in Filecoin from across the globe descending on Las Vegas. We have an all-star lineup of speakers with Claudia being one of our featured featured presenters. Can you give the audience just a little bit of a sneak preview on where AI and Filecoin intersect? Yeah. Um, so I think my talk is going to go through three points on like, you know, very concrete value prop of Filecoin now that there's AI, a little more abstract, and then the most abstract. Um, the most concrete one is you've got big old data sets. You got to store them somewhere. You want to make sure that they didn't get changed or corrupted. Um, Filecoin's a good option for that. Enables sharing, like a lot of the public data sets, like big data sets that Filecoin uses are the same ones that you would be running a model over. Um, training data should be there. It should be public. Well, maybe not necessarily public, but a lot like there should be public training data sets. Um, and it should be easy to share those and it should be easy to content address those and, you know, know that you're replicable with your experiment. Um, so that's cool. Filecoin already does that. The next step is again, back to that data sovereignty piece. Like, and this is not stuff that Filecoin supports. It's more stuff that Banyan supports. You don't want an AI training on your data. So, you know, you want encryption. You want to know that. And like, again, like the data sovereignty also kind of plugs into what Project Starling is doing. Like you want to make sure something's not AI generated. So it's good to check it into a blockchain with, you know, some proof that, you know, maybe it was taken with a physical camera, which is an interesting thing that Project Starling can already do. So kind of defending, like thinking more, thinking less about AI enablement thinking more about AI defense for the individual and the business. Someone else is training on your data. Someone else is making fake data with an AI. What are the things that the cryptography in Filecoin and on top of Filecoin can do to make the world a less scary place now that we've got this incredibly powerful technology that you know sometimes seems a little bit out of control to people? Um, the third thing I want to talk about is democratizing AI. And there's a lot of you know, we already have, you know, it takes a jillion dollars to train a large net. Um, these H100s are really getting bought up. You saw NVIDIA's earnings, like this is a sparse commodity. Like people, people are really having trouble getting training time, um, being able to run. Like Llama is really promising because it's a very small net that you can run locally, but there's not, like it's, it's, people are very scared about, you know, OpenAI and Google and the other really big, People in tech, like entities in tech, are the only ones that can train AIs. I think that that's bad because just for me alone, with ChatGPT, my productivity increases have been absolutely insane. Um, I think that this is a very powerful technology that should not just be in the hands of like the big, like governments and mega tech companies. Um, I think there should be a democratization. There should be small startups able to use this, and even individuals should be able to use it on their own data without having to hand all of their data over to Google or OpenAI or Microsoft or whatever. Um, that's the ideal outcome. If the outcome is such that Google has to own all of your data before you're able to get the power out of this, that's no good. So I think that Filecoin with like, you know, you've got this decentralized storage, so you can put your data into like a semi-sovereign container, and then you can potentially use a compute network like Bacalao, Expanso, Expanso IPVM, uh, to run compute jobs on someone else's H100 that you're just renting for a little bit in a decentralized way, that's going to be really exciting. So that's I'm going to go through these three different things, um, enablement, uh, defense, and then back to like democratization and enable it, enablement in my talk. Um, I need to do a little more, bit more research and write my slides before I give this talk. But I'm very excited to uh, hear the community's response. I love when people come and like ask me questions and add to it and like send me things to read. So if you hear my talk and you have thoughts like, don't be mean, but like if you have a paper to send me, like that's that's my one request. Uh, please bring it up with me so that I can learn a little more. Very nice. So besides Phil Vegas, Claudia, where can people find you? Where can people find all the work Banyan is up to? Um, 
we're starting to post on our social media. We're going to have a blog on our website. Uh, Twitter is Banyan Computer, all one word. Website is banyan.computer. Um, that's the whole URL. Um, me personally, yeah, I'm in the Protocol Labs network directory and in the Slack, so you can just reach out. Um, I'm a little busy right now, but if it's if it's a cool person with interesting things to say, happy to book time to talk. Um, yeah, subscribe to our social media and you can keep up with Banyan there. We're starting to wake that up and start posting there. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably the best ways. Well, it is not too late to register for Phil Vegas. Uh, we have an all-star lineup. Go to, if you go to the Phil Vegas registration page, you'll see Claudia's picture there as well as a lot of other fascinating industry experts and professionals. Hope to see you all there. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Claudia about what's cool. And I will end with something I know that it's cool and it's, it's Claudia. Thank you for your time. It <laughs> was too. super awesome to hear how your brain works, how your life has progressed. And uh, I'm looking forward to big things from yourself and from Banyan. Yeah. And for, for D-Web Decoded, thank you for tuning in. Have a great week. Hope to see you in Vegas. Claudia, you're the best. Thank you, Porter. Thank you, everyone.